We met, I think, when I was 10 and you were 8. Yeah, so more than 40 years. Really started hanging out in high school. He wouldn't hang out with me until then. Once Ben had made a name for himself in local television. He tried to ride my coattails and he's been doing it ever since. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, I'm Matt Damon. I'm Ben Affleck. This is the timeline of our careers together. Together. Field of Dreams. So um, we did a lot of extra work in Boston because we wanted to be actors and we knew College Pickman, which was a local casting agency and we could be close to sets and watch people do things. And uh, one of the big movies that came to town was Field of Dreams. We're in the crowd. We're in the bleachers. 3,000 people (laughs) and we're two of the 3,000 people. It was very hard to get any access to Fenway Park. So I remember feeling like, wow, we were really lucky to even be in the ballpark. Yeah, it was a special thing, like kind of behind the scenes, the game wasn't happening. That was a big deal. And I also remember seeing James Earl Jones, Kevin Costner, play the scene where they walk down one of the sort of alleys there, the pedestrian ramps, kind of feeling like, you know, wow, I'm close to a real movie with a real, you know, Kevin Costner was like, James Earl Jones, I mean, you, you, you couldn't kind of get bigger than that. So it was really a thrill. I ended up working with the same director again in Some of All Fears, and I was like, you know, we worked together before, and he didn't remember me, but I was like, yeah, you and Matt. I was like, great. Yeah, okay, if I'm Matt too. And funnily enough, I went to visit the set of Some of All Fears, and Phil cast me again as an extra in his movie. <laughs> remember, I, I put on a waiter's coat, and I walked he past. you were suited to it. Yeah, no, you graduated to the lead of the next film that he did, and I still remained an extra. I know who cheated. Who? It was Green. What? It was... Yeah, Green, I saw him do it. You're a liar! I, I saw him cheat! I just remember with school ties, audition after audition, I mean, we auditioned so many times. We both auditioned and Matt got a really cool leading part and I got cast as the bully anti-Semite with six lines. Luckily, I didn't let it affect me or my self-esteem at the time. Later on, I did a movie called The Way Back where I worked with a group of young guys who were playing the basketball players and it really reminded me of how much fun we had. Being that team, rehearsing the plays, you know, the the camaraderie of the group and Freddie Francis was the cinematographer who was this legendary cinematographer and we met Cole Hauser on that and and Chris Chris O'Donnell and Anthony Rapp and Randall Badenkoff and Lushelko Ivanek who's yeah, I mean, you know, it was just in the last duel. You know, he's somebody we've known who's brilliant. It was a big, big deal for us. They did put us up in a small condo complex adjacent to a dump. So we the, moved into that place. <laughs> did because, yeah, but, yeah, because we wanted to get out of the hotel. Right. And we realized the amount of money they had on the hotel deal we could take. And we saved like $5 a night by moving to the dump. So we moved we to the dump. dump. Felt great to be doing the movie together. It was unclear whether it was a big break but a lot of those a big break for Brennan actually so really kind of and Chris O'Donnell got sent to a woman after that when you're a young actor you always have the sense of kind of who else is auditioning for what and what else is kind of going on and had a couple of movies like that where you sort of felt like okay well some other people kind of broke and you were sort of back to like getting your pages faxed to you and you know going to your next audition you know if I told any of my friends back home about this they wouldn't believe me over a failing grade in French good grades the right schools the right colleges, the right connections. Those are the keys to the kingdom. I remember his screen test because I already had the part. They found Brendan after a long search. I mean, all of us had read for that role multiple times and and, uh, none of us were quite right for it. But I just remember Brendan, I mean, we both remember him as just being so kind. And yeah, just a really a good guy. person. You, know, yeah. you got that sense from Brendan that way. It's like, no ego, it wasn't, and you know, young guys can be sort of indistinguishable from chimpanzees, you know, sometimes. And he was kind and gracious and he could have easily lorded it over everyone that he was the lead and the guy. And I remember he came to my house for like a barbecue, my mom's house in Cambridge, you know, and he just was sweet. I've always really, I just like the guy and I'm really, really glad for him. The director really wanted me to have my shirt off. And I remember thinking, how do I say to the director, I don't want to have my shirt off. I was self-conscious about my body and, you know, I didn't think I'd look good. And then, but I was embarrassed to do push-ups in front of the other guys. And now no one's embarrassed, by the way. You go in these sets and there's like 18 trainers and it was like, pump, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like weight sets. On yeah, the, everyone just takes it for granted. At that time, you were supposed to pretend that you weren't vain. There's no pretension to that. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to start off by saying that it is a real pleasure to finally meet you. Absolute pleasure. One of the main reasons that we started this whole thing was to finally meet the guys that do Blunt Man and Chronic. Snoochie Snoochie Booches, booches, huh?
It was the first time I had ever been played a lead. I had been cast as, like I said, bullies and baddies. So for Kevin to cast me as somebody with feelings, who was sensitive, who was who had dialogue that that was interesting, was huge for me. You gotta respect that kind of display of affection. You know what I mean? Sure, it's crazy, it's rude, it's self-absorbed, but. Uh... You know, it's love. It was a $250,000 budget and I slept on Kevin's couch and it was like, you got a buddy, this guy, Matt, he'll, will he be in it? And Matt was better known better known than I was. He had done Geronimo, he'd been the you know second lead in School Ties, he'd done a, a Tommy Lee Jones, TNT film uh, yep. also. So that was a great coup to have Matt. Have but that fun. was a huge role for you. It was Jason. a big, big yeah, deal yeah. for me. Kevin Smith was really obliging, so he gave me a lot of small parts over the years in movies. He was totally ben happy was the to lead. exploit Matt Starr <laughs> for his own benefit. Uh, and so was I. No, no, no. You don't owe it to yourself. You owe it to me. Because tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'll be 50. And I'll still be doing this shit. That's all right. That's fine. I mean, you're sitting on a winning lottery ticket. I started it in a playwriting class in college and wrote the first 40 pages of it and handed and we were we were tasked with writing a one act play for this by the end of the semester and I handed this in to the professor who I really liked and I said I think I failed your class because this is not a one act play but I th I believe it's the first act of a movie he was really effusive in his praise for what I'd done and he gave me an A in his class which really and he said keep going with this I showed it to Ben and and I had enough because of this professor's reaction I had enough confidence to show it to my friend and I said I don't know what to do like I'm stuck with this and Ben read it and goes I don't know what to do either but we should do it together and that was it of that initial 40 pages I, I only like five pages survived the one scene that survived was this first meeting that I have with Robin Williams which is almost verbatim it's almost it verbatim written, the way I was. yeah that scene we both really liked Ben out of the blue just said you know if he said those things to the guy, you know, meaning Robin Williams, the guy would have to have a response, you know? And I think he would tell him a story. I think it would be a mind. And he started to kind of like chunk out that whole monologue that Robin Williams has on the park bench to me. You don't know about real loss, because it only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. I doubt you've ever dared to love anybody that much. We didn't have any aspirations to write. We were we really wanted jobs as actors. That was our entire goal. The gift we had was we had a high school teacher, really, who who didn't make it feel like these were distinct silos. He had us improvise and create our own scenes and sort of semi-write them. He would really actually kind of rewrite them and make them make sense. But we had the sense that we were writing them. So we felt empowered. The way we wrote the, the movie was exactly the way Jerry taught us to write in high school. Yeah, for sure. With our actors, we're always very I mean, solicitous, solicitous of, yeah. of, of what they're feeling because they're in it, right? And so when somebody's in it, like I remember on Minnie Driver saying like, I, I, I feel like, and we were like, whatever you feel yeah, is, do is do it, right? Like if it doesn't feel like you should say that, don't say that, right? It, we wrote the wrong line. Yeah, we're not like, coming from some like, we've written this mighty tech prose right, and speaking. It, as it's written, written and rolled trippingly off the tongue. We were like, this is probably a disaster. I'm sure what you can do is better. All of you here who are actors are all writers, you're all filmmakers, you're all part of this thing. All of your voices are important. You're all gonna contribute something that we couldn't come up with ourselves. So like, please be generous and, and give it to us. Casey's bouncing up a bar uh, at Harvard next week. We should go up there. What are we gonna do up there? I don't know. We'll fuck up some smart kids. Probably fit right in. It was more pressure to be in Boston. I remember the first night we were there, a bunch of our high school friends showed up with a case of beer. And we were like, guys, this is this is not the beer time. We're working. Like, this isn't, like, they, I think they were they associated us coming to Boston with, like, an opening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it's yeah, a big drunk, party. Right? You know what I mean? Like, it's a movie opening. We're all going associated to the movie. Associated most things with beer. Right? Yeah. yeah. And we were like, you know, fuck off. <laughs> like, we're shooting at 6 in the morning. You guys got to leave. Sean. If the professor calls about that job, just tell him, sorry. I had to go see about a girl. Will. Son of a bitch. He stole my life. Robin would open the door and come out and he'd find this letter. And I was right next to Gus, next to the camera. And I would say, because we wanted him to, as if he was hearing my voice, right? Said, you know, Sean, if the professor calls about that job, tell him sorry, I had to go see about a girl. So I would say that. And what was scripted was that he just takes a moment and he realizes that I'm gone. And in true Robin fashion, we did 60 takes, you know, like we just left the camera rolling and he kept coming out and kept coming out. And he did something different every single time. And I remember when he said, son 
of a bitch, she stole my line. I grabbed Gus's shoulders, like, I, and I felt him tense up. Like, we both knew, we were like, holy shit, like, what a line. Like, how did we not think of that? Like, that is great. So obviously, obvious. it was, the whole movie was leading to yeah. that line. Like, clearly, we thought this whole thing out. <laughs> Just like we planned it. It was a very surreal experience to go because the year before we were shooting Goodwill Hunting, we watched it in the condo we rented in Toronto with Gus and Casey and Cole. And to go from that experience where, you know, we filled out the sheets and we were betting on who was gonna win to being in the front row of the Oscars together with our moms in one year, it felt like warp speed to suddenly be, and, and to have Billy Crystal singing a song about us. We were sitting next to our moms and, I, and, and we won and we kind of hugged our moms. And I remember how everyone had made such a big thing out of it as if this was such a novelty. And I remember thinking, being insecure, like, why why is it weird that we're bringing our moms? Like, who else do you think we would bring? You know what I mean? Like, that, there was nobody else that was going to go. To, you know what I mean? That was it. Of course our moms were going to go. That was really was innocent and not faked and 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 I, I remember Alec Baldwin off stage oh, yeah, and yeah, being yeah. like enjoy this yeah, remember yeah, this yeah. And don't what like, you have don't fuck this up I, was like, I, I can't I can't <laughs> feel anything <laughs> yeah. had we been given free will we could choose to ignore the pain like they do but no we're servants okay you know all I'm saying here is that one of us might need a little nap Kevin's very focused on the written word and he's got a very kind of like a cadence that he likes but I thought it was a really creative, interesting script. And it was a sort of imagining of Catholicism in a very literal sense and also in a comic sense. I was thinking my kids would actually might like that. They have that, that sense of humor. Kevin's always had the sense of humor of an adolescent. I have seen what happens to the proud when they take on the throne. I'm going back to Wisconsin. <laughs> We're going home, Loki. And no one, not you, not even the almighty himself, is gonna make that up. It, it was, was a, a really great fun movie, cast, interesting dude. movie. George Linda Carlin, Ferentino, Chris Rock, Chris, Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman, yeah. And it was a really cool group of people to be, Alanis Morissette. Yeah. It was yeah. like a fun group of people to just be associated with. It felt special and it felt it felt like, you know, I was doing that and Shakespeare in Love at the same time. So I had the same haircut and all of a sudden I was doing like multiple movies. I mean, I sit around for a year waiting to be on an after school special. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I was doing different, different parts and it, uh, it was a very exciting, exhilarating, thrilling time to be 25 or whatever it was. Tongue or lion face? Lion face. Lion face? Ha! Lemon face. Mm. Lion face. Ha! Lemon face. Mm. Break it down. Where are we taking it from, Gus? Gus was like not even paying attention. He was just counting a stack of money behind the camera. And really funny idea, you know, that like we instantly completely sold out and we're already making Goodwill Hunting 2 hunting season. It was like a day of shooting. And, and yeah, we got everybody back together from that bar scene. It was kind of our desire to kind of like our reaction to what it was a very just personal, small seeming intimate sort of movie that then became kind of something bigger. I remember feeling kind of wanting to react against it and maybe like not in a smart way, but by uh, thinking like, no, I'm just still the same person. I want to sort of debunk this whole idea of being, you know, like that this is somehow like special or something. I, I don't know. It was very confusing. You know, the idea, well, I'm going to be real. I'm going to be the same person, but life is different. You say I am not the captain. You say to me, I am not the captain here. I say to you whatever I like. I decide who's the captain of them. I read the book and Scorsese had been attached to it for a really long time and his option had run out. I guess he didn't know exactly what he wanted to do with it. Couldn't crack it really. Couldn't, so, no, he... Yeah, couldn't crack it. And I wrote to uh, Drew Goddard who wrote The Martian and in this series of emails back and forth, we kind of came across this idea of making it a story of perspective and telling it from three different perspectives and having her perspective, the person with the least agency, be the person who's the most honest and sees the world really for what it is. And Ben was over for dinner and he's like, what are you working on? I'm like, I don't know, I got this thing. Well, what is it? And I explained the idea. And he goes, that's a great idea. Where's the book? And I handed him the book. And like the next morning at seven, he called me and he was like, I want to do it. Let's write it together. And I was like, did you stay up all night and read the book? And he's like, yeah. Closer. Lord, I become your man. I swear I shall serve you for life. As we started working together, it was so much fun. Not that the subject matter, and Nicole Hall Center, it should be said, wrote the best stuff in the movie and was a joy to work with. Yeah, but that amazing. process of the three of us was so much fun and so rewarding. Jody and Adam, who were amazing. Oh, and Ridley was really, you know, just was was very kind of collaborative. It was really a learning experience for me watching him shoot. I thought like, okay, I want to steal this, I want to steal this, I want to steal this, I want to steal this. Hey, somebody I've idolized for a long time. At somewhere along the, that point, we thought, why haven't we done this more? We yeah. should do this more often. 
something because it was so much so much so fun. fun even as dark and and painful a story as that is thrilling if you love it and um we loved it i'm willing to bet my career on michael jordan oh, come on man you ask me what i do here this is what i do yeah i find you players and i fucking feel it this time i think people have a vision of the director with the bullhorn and the riding crop and the beret or something <laughs> like you know but really to me it's about casting great performers and trying to make them feel comfortable and valued and at ease because you're going to get the most beautiful stuff and also matt's a fucking genius who i really didn't even quite realize how good he was until i was cutting the movie you get <laughs> painted into a corner a lot and you need to have that ripcord that shoot that emergency shoot which was always matt no matter what was happening in a scene you could cut to matt he's always authentic he's always present and there's always something fucking interesting about what he's doing. He's, he's beautiful and magnificent in this movie, and it made me realize how how really good he's been throughout. Look, Ben's a great director, and, and that's very generous to say that I was somehow, you know, indicating to people that they could trust him. I mean, I think the fact that he's already got the Best Picture Oscar, they, people signed up and they were pretty excited about it. The environment, as as I've heard all of them say, and all of them have been talking about, you know, was was about as good as it gets in terms of being open to create and, and bring what you bring and feel like your ideas we're gonna have a forum and the best idea would win. So it's kind of the dream dream set, really. Turns out he knows what he's doing. If you really look at Jordan, like I did, you're gonna see exactly what I see. Which is what? The most competitive guy I have ever seen. He is a fucking killer. Every day was a joy. I got to work with Matt every day. I love the guy. I really appreciate his friendship and the experience of the joy of uh, friendship in this life and uh, you know he's it's wonderful it's a real gift honestly the best job i ever had i i, I literally i mourned it when it was over i really did i it it was so fun at some point we got convinced of this idea like well you don't want to work together all the time or you'll become sort of associated with each other and that's negative but ultimately it was sort of like fuck that i don't know let's work together because that's the beautiful that's and fun. we're getting old you know and it's like it's 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 you know, I mean, after my father passed away, like it really does give you a perspective of, we can now look at the last 20 years and go like, well, the benefit of hindsight, what would we have done differently? And I think we both came to the conclusion that we would have worked together a lot more. Yeah, you had 50, you might not get 20 more. Life is happening now. You know, it's not the decision you write right. tomorrow. This is it. Our this is life. what we want to yeah, do. Right here. Thank you.